I just turned off my camera. I meant to turn this off. <laughs> okay. So here we go. And I shall turn the volume up a little bit. Hello, everybody. So as we agreed yesterday, or like I promised, better said, to give you information regarding the, the uh, cooperation that we're having in the uh, industry, um, petroleum industry. So how we would held down the uh, the uh, fall that started um, or decline that started 14 years ago. And last year it would reached a crisis because we were losing 200,000 barrels a day. Um, And the government had a uh, constant decrease in the production. And they opted uh, for the um, they want to talk about or mention the workers and engineers, even the basic and transitory workers that have helped so much in the area of Pemex. So now with, with the workers and with investment, because they, they had not invested in Pemex, there was approximately, like they had a deliberate purpose of, of ruining Pemex and the Federal Commission of Electricity. It was a perverse plan to end with these uh, public uh, industries that are pu fundamental for our country, for the sovereignty and for independence. So then we were able to uh, stabilize the, the decline, and now we're going to increase the production and increase investment. And also we did the same with the refineries that they that they turned over to us, abandoned, that were stopped. Uh, several of them were stopped with low production. And now we're raising those up, uh, production. And, and we want to recognize as well as the Secretary of Energy uh, and the Director of uh, Pemex, two public servants that are first quality or first rate. They're the best that we have at these times that are so difficult because of what we're going through. And now what we've already, uh, we got Pemex in a deplorable condition. Let's not let this or stop taking into account and not forget that they lied these technocrats and those that devoted themselves to trafficking influences and they took the, the their experts, their voice boxes, they lied saying that the energy reform was the panacea 
that if we approved, we would be much better off producing more petroleum. So by this time, we would, we would have 13 million barrels a day. You could see the documents. And even they considered, it, it was even cons the considerations that were considered by law that were proposed. And it resulted that they left us 1,700,000 uh, uh, and it was falling, free falling at a point. And they haven't said half a word regarding that lie and misappropriation. They gave out the contracts to particular people and only one company out of a hundred out of 207 contracts is producing a quantity that's actually marginal that's very limited when it uh, comes to production of crude out of 207 contracts. If we had not intervened with a budget, with public investment, imagine how we would be now with such a tremendous crisis, economical and financial, very irresponsible what they did. But fortunately now, this matter is being attended to and it's turning out okay and we've been fortunate that they're finding petroleum that is to say there is new discoveries in fields that are being worked they're giving us results. They're very productive. And we're investing well. Before, let's not forget, the lack of a public um, So the little bit that they did use was to um, dig in the north and in the water where there is no petroleum and where it's more expensive to pull out the petroleum. They were leaving as a reserve so that when they finished, uh, 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 so they could finish using all that up, then the campuses or the fields of the southeast <coughs> So there was areas that had um, fields that were in flatlands, and there is where we dug, and that strategy has been good. Yes, we, we knew, of course, they knew where the petroleum was, but they didn't care to produce petroleum to benefit Pemex. What they devoted themselves over a long time to uh, squeeze Plemex by uh, charging for contracts that they would uh, give out without benefits to the public, Hacienda or real estate. Let's not forget that they, give, they gave out all that area of uh, somewhere he said that they explored for gas also with the deception that there would increase production and and they they gave a juicy uh, a juicy contract to a Spanish company called Arepsol 
and then there was no more production of gas, but they took millions of um, millions, thousands of millions of uh, uh, pesos. It was good for them, but it was bad for our nation. So that's done. That will not be permitted. That is not permitted. And fortunately, our new strategy is uh, permitting us to rescue Pemex, which will convert itself in a small amount of time in in the uh, like the crutch. And so we're investing now in uh, Pemex to increase the production. So we'll have prime material and we'll be able to use our own gasoline and not have to buy it from foreign countries. And with these uh, uh, and funds that we get from Pemex by, uh, by the uh, summer, we'll have resources to support the fields and we're going to uh, plant some more petroleum. We're going we're gonna to utilize the uh, funds from Pemex to to increase our self-sufficiency uh, and also in the food area. So then now we're going to let Octavio uh, Romero Oropesa to talk to us over this matter. With your permission, Mr. President, very good day to all. We are going to comment and inform you regarding the behavior of the production in this administration. So we can observe here on this graph the behavior of the production since uh, January of 2018 to the projection that we have now for this year. You can observe that in November, the medium was 1,700, 200 barrels. They had a very strong decline. And in January, we were 1,600 um, barrels. And as of now, we've had an increase in production. And the median in these 23 or 24 days of September, we're, we're at 1,715,000. It's above the median of uh, la November last year. And, and it's about 85 to 95,000 uh, for the uh, increase from the 85 to 90,000 brute loss we had. And here you can observe on this graph what is the behavior we're observing. We can foresee that by the end of this year, you can observe that there is a deferment in the production and, and it's got a reason, it's programmed because we're going to detain the production. It'll last about 9 to 10 days. And then posteriorly, the prognosis is an increase up until we get to December with an estimated of 1,778,000 barrels daily by the month of December. We are previewing that by the last days of December, we should be about a million seven hundred barrels. And with that production, we can initiate what will be used in the next year. So here, you can see the behavior uh, that we, did, we stopped the fall or decline. And now you can see a raise that's been going up. Next slide. So these are um, some drilling uh, wells that are going to be starting this week and to the end of this year. 
and what will help us to increase the production. At the end of September and the end of this week, we should, in the Camp Chiquin 22, will start. And then October, they'll start Civics 1, which in, is in the campus of Civics. And then again, in November, they'll have another one in Civics, and then Valeriana, and then one in Keski, in Tabasco. And then in December, we're going to start we're, we're going to have various um, pits or drilling wells in all these areas that you see there. There's quite a few. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They said five, but I counted nine. So they said that is the largest campus which is being developed. It's a large campus, giant campus. <clears throat> so, so he's naming all the ones that are going to come in. They have indigenous names, so they're very hard to pronounce. <laughs> so, so this is what we predicted, or pre previewed, and uh, they'll be starting before the end of the year. So we're, we're talking about this increase in production. And so the next one. Now, here I'm going to refer to what I was telling you um, regarding the deferment of production that you saw in the graphic. It looked like a descent. It derives from a freeing. Uh, it'll start in the 1st of October, and they'll liberate or suspension of operations and production in order to do productive and uh, rep maintenance. Um, so they're going to be programming. So they're going to be working on Tank You Cannot, which is called the, the Man or the Man of the Seas in Maya language, which should have a production of 6,000. 50, 61,000 barrels, but also since we're going to be doing this maintenance, we're going to take advantage. Uh, we're going to we're going to uh, do some uh, repairs and maintenance on C7 and C8. So this should happen in a couple of days, and the deferment should be around 356 barrels of oil, that's 356,000. So that'll be about a million barrels. So if we take a median to that mi uh, uh, within the days of the month, a daily deferment of 31,000 barrels. But within the first to eight to 10 days, it won't be 33,000. It'll look like a lot more because we're talking about a median. And that's why in the graphic, the prognosis of production for the next month of October, we plan on a, a production of 1,700, uh, I'm sorry, 1,700,000. And this month it's 1,715. With this deferment, we expect that next month it'll be 1,700,000. If we did not do that, we would be surely about 1,700,000. It was in an increase, but due to our um, stopping the work in order to do repairs, it'll be a little bit of a decrease. And just so that you'll understand why there's going to be a, a decrease, and it'll look like a fall, but it's not uh, noticeable that it's simply a deferment. And also we wanted to comment with you something that is very important that has to do with our reserves. This year, uh, 2019, in the, for the first time in the last 15 years, we will have an increase in the reserves 
uh, 2p and 1p this is product that like the president said which is of the exploration and we've been fortunate and we've had good discoveries to such an extent that we've increased and we estimate an increase of 2,000 million barrels. And it's practically confirmed that we will have uh, 1 million 600. And in 1P, an increase at the end of the year for 200 million barrels. This is very important because in the past, we had not had this increase in reserves in the last 15 years. So we were taking more out of our reserve. It was more than we uh, that we pulled out than what we were putting in reserve. And as of this year, we stopped that tendency. It changes. So that will affect the next year. And here you can see the 2,006 million barrels by the end of the year. And that's 1P, 7 million um, barrels in 2019, and in, and in uh, 2020 uh, will be at 7.2 uh, million barrels. So at the end of this administration, our reserve should be 8.8 thousand million barrels. So this will go with it. It will not also be an increase in the production, but also in the reserve. This is very important. Uh, there's no more graphics? No? Okay, so I guess that's it. Hello, everyone. With your permission, Mr. President, the report that we are making is according to the indications that we received from the President of the Republic, and we proceeded in the system of refining that has six refineries from Pemex to implement an emergency plan to rescue or elevate the production. This plan uh, can, has a maintenance that was emergent because the refineries were practically, well, sev very poor, uh, poor uh, maintenance, not even the basic maintenance. And the second part was the rehabilitation, which is ma major maintenance and change of equipment and maintenance. So with this, we count on the support of Pemex, and Pemex is investing 12,500 uh, pesos for the uh, for the six refineries this year. So this 12,500 uh, will be for uh, re the program of rehabilitation, and we've planned to start in the month of August, but actually we started with some of the plants the first few uh, weeks of September because we were waiting for on some parts that had not arrived. And up to this date, we are still receiving due to the Department of Procurement. And the maintenance seems to indicate that it's being done by direct administration. So that is to say the workers of Pemex, the the, pro, the technic, technician uh, professionals, workers that have a true spirit of innovation, they are the ones that have been doing practically the initiation of these maintenance works and the initiation of rehabilitation. In this graph, you can see how we received in December in 2018. The first day was 507,000 barrels of a day for processing, what is equivalent to 32% of the capacity of our national system of refinery. And the red is the production of gasolines. But also remember 
and the people that are listening that also in the refineries we produce diesel, turbosine, combustibles, other fundamental elements. But here we're talking only about gasoline. So little by little we elevated the load with maintenance in a measure so that we started taking action refinery by refinery. You can see how we increase the load little by little up until reaching to the month of September. In the month of September, we had um, 814,000 barrels, which is the equivalent of 52%. And today we had 779 because the refinery from uh, Minitlan had some kind of a pour in its serpentine, which is what we're also working on that. But but it's around 50% or from the 32% we received to 50% now. So the system of processing so you can see that now we've started, as of August, first week of September, to intervene with some plants in the different refineries. And at the end, we'll be able to see. The next graphic is very general. This is refinery by refinery. And, and you can see the names, Cadereta, Madero, Minitlan, Salamanta, uh, Tol Toluca, and they said another one, SC, I'm not sure what that was. So that was in December, November, not November when we received it, but practically when we started to take actions to stabilize the refineries, and we started to put into each one different loads. And this program is in conjunction. We can't do a, a separate program for each refinery because if one, uh, like say for example, Salamanca has to intervene in a distilling uh, uh, tower, then they will prepare Tula in order to prevent, to stop the production on the other one. So they kind of work with each other uh, to process, to not allow any decline. So as of August, we started to increase the load, even though some of the uh, plants had already started to have intervening. But all this month of preparation and maintenance has helped us so that the uh, uh, refinery plants could handle more load. We've done works, like you can see a few pictures where in Salamanca, they call them like these plates, these huge plates that are uh, of stainless steel that sometimes are very bad in rehabilitation and that now the workers in the, in the shop of Salamanca made their own plates. No, we did not go buying it with that technology. We, they made them there. For example, Caradeta has some these uh, vapor tubs that were completely destroyed in order to, to loosen the uh, hydrocarbons in the exchange of heat. But in less than two months, they're like practically new. And that is man hours that saved us very much money. And a lot of them have a lot of people working, and they're working on all these equipment that had been abandoned. So this is in general how we're working and how we're preparing to close in December, such as we had projected to the president with a load of 900,000 barrels a day. And we hope that in the end of December, hopefully more if we could, and then by the year of 220, we'll come to the second phase of uh, rehabilitation where we will have to reach to the design of the uh, refineries. And if you permit me, Mr. President, I want to give you a, show you a, a brief video so you could see what the workers and operators of the Mexican petroleum industry are doing. Works of rehabilitation 
plant my uh, line of transfer. Francisco Madero, Ciudad de Madero, City of Madero. Ignacio Dovali Jaime Salina Cruz, Tanque de Almanecimiento, that's a tank, of a uh, containment tank. Oh, and they've got a long list of things <laughs> that they've been doing to repair. So they've got everything working. Awesome. Check that out. And they're doing as much hand repair as they can to save money. It's all about austerity. Uh, Oral Lázaro Cárdenas Manitlán. So they've got a bunch of repairs they did there. Look at that. And then in Hidalgo, Tula, they've done a lot of repairs as well. You could stop the video and see what all the repairs are, but it looks like they've re rehabilitated the uh, the whole place. Wow. So you can see the six refineries, the small images, but you can see the works that they've been doing, these workers of the petroleum industry. Thank you. That's all, Mr. President. So that's the general information regarding this matter. So, Mr. President, hello. Eh, Good day. Se habla de un plazo, de We're speaking meses. of a period of approximately 11 months of the rehabilitation. I was going to be asking for concrete data, but here there they are, the concrete data. So this takes to confirm what the president had said before, that Pemex would be converted into the pillar of the Mexican economy. And now, isn't there a risk that we could return to make the uh, uh, Mexican economy dependent on the petroleum industry? Because we need to discover more um, fields, and if there exists that risk, is it not possible that what you narrated, if there was not a participation that was enthusiastic from the workers from Pemex, how is the relation with the workers of Pemex right now and the commitment, and how large is the participation of the workers? of Pemex as of now, and obviously the ones that are indicated. And this all takes us to to think that if this was done to 10, uh, 11 months, it would seem like a solution. So what were the previous governments doing then in the past years? For decades, if this is possible to do in 10 or 11 months, and I forgot to present myself. I'm Roberto Cruz from Impacto, and I have a few more questions, but these two things. So the participation and uh, uh, propelling the economy. Yes, we are at the same time increasing all the productive areas, but it was strategic the recovery of Pemex, the rescue of Pemex, as it is strategic to recover the Federal Commission of Electricity in our priorities that we've defined, it is the well-being of the people it's the first thing to better the conditions of life and the conditions of work for the people of Mexico and to gain the well-being of uh, uh, the body and then of the soul and to make the people happy. And that's why we're um, purposing more than 300 thousand million pesos and by giving it directly to the Mexican people overall especially to the poor people like never before so first that and second 
priority the rescue of the energy sector. And that is what we are gaining. Because this implied to destined resources. And Octavio will talk to you about that. How much has it meant this investment with Pemex in relation to the previous year? And how much do we estimate to we will invest in the following year? So we are saving and investing in Pemex because I've already expressed we need we expect that in by the year of 21 when we have more production the the uh, funds from Pemex will help us to finance the national development the petroleum will be like the crutch for the development that's the strategy that is the second great priority and the third thing is the public security and peace in our country to to gain the peace that is the way in which we are working as the mechanic of, of government, it was decided to first have it be very clear the bad that was that was uh, plaguing Mexico. We we had the diagnosis. We knew what the principal di diagnosis of, and we're fixing it. Corruption. So zero corruption, zero impunity. So that is the main uh, uh, joint. Not only does that help the country to become more moralized, but it also liberates funds to attend to the demands of the people, the priorities of the people. But also the strategy of the government has agreed that we were not going to have <coughs> 1,000 or 2,000 programs, but instead a 100. Because there was 1,000 or 2,000 programs that were being spread out in actions of government, but all of it was administrative apparatus, bureaucratic apparatus, and none of the money ever came to the people. For example, there's a program that we're working on that are massive. The support for elderly adults is for 8 million adults. It's not uh, to attend to certain adults, like from, from a certain region. No, it's a program that is universal for all. The grants for students, 10 million. The work for the youth as apprentices, 900,000. The pension for uh, children and that are disabled, 900,000 as of now. The support to the workers, 2 million. So like that in general. So therefore, in this way, it's not just a, a certain activity, and it was very important, the recovery for the nation, the petroleum. Let's not forget that, that Rockefeller used to say, he used to say, petroleum is the best business of the world. And petroleum that is poorly administrated is the second best way to make business. 
That is to say that petroleum is business. Why? Why would we ask this? Because you don't have to pay rent to nature. To extract a barrel of oil costs us about $10. And we would sell it at 55 or $60 today. So what is the gain or utility? $40 per barrel. What other uh, economic activity leaves that kind of a uh, gain? And that is why at the same time it is a great temptation And that is why they went launching themselves against petroleum and they wanted to privatize it completely. They wanted to divide it, this uh, utility. And at the end, the contracts that they gave they call them utility contracts that are uh, shared. That is to say that that gain is not for the nation completely, but instead it's divided or given or shared among with these business uh, companies. And so they gave these contracts like this and what we're waiting is that they produce because they did not even comply with the investment that they or to produce not even when they are going to stay to, to keep these contracts with a percentage of the utilities. So all these things, we are not doing these to question or, and we're not trying to cancel the contracts. We are not going to do this. The only thing is that if there is no production with these contracts that we, that were given, then we cannot continue us to say that they will continue. And we will not be continue to give in concessions because what we are doing now is with the participation of the public sector and Pemex, which is a public, na uh, it belongs to the nation. The petroleum does not belong to the government. It doesn't even belong to the Mexican state. The petroleum belongs to the nation. So therefore, that is what will be, uh, has been gained in the case of energy reform. We have not decided, and there is a commitment that we will not modify the terms because, fortunately, we can count on 80% of the uh, potential of petroleum. They didn't have enough time to give it all away. The, the whole area of petroleum in Mexico. So do uh, the contracts, we're talking about 20% of, of the potential of the petroleum industry. And what we're demonstrating here 
is that if a company, a public company, is managed with honesty and efficiency, it will uh, proceed and the utility or the benefits are for the nation, for everyone. And that is a little bit about your question. So what does it mean that the development then is completely Pemex? As you were talking about the social programs and all that. Well, it is integral. Well, so say, say all the all the auctions and all the airplane, but Pemex is the great thing we're, uh, uh, or two or three things. First, to finance the development of Mexico, not to permit corruption, unearthing corruption, and with austerity. That's the first part. And that we can see that it works, and that does function. We're not gain, increasing taxes. We're not increasing the prices of gases or combustibles. We're not putting the country in debt. And we have our budget. And there is well-being. But in order to have more well-being, what do we need? Of course, maintenance of zero corruption, zero impunity, zero luxuries in the government, and to add two components more, two elements more to this plan. One, the recovery of the energy sector, because it means increases uh, of, of income to the nation. There is no company that is as rentable like Pemex. It is, even though they tried to destroy it and they and they worked very hard on destroying it, it's still, on a worldwide level, one of the most rentable uh, companies, and it will be so much more. So the energy sector, the complement, and the other thing that will permit us to develop more of the basic and to uh, make uh, Mexico into uh, power to gain more economic growth. Because as you have more economic growth, then you have more jobs, well-being, uh, public finances that are stronger, more uh, money, more funds, re more increased taxes, recovery. How do you see this uh, increase of uh, the increase in government, supporting strategic projects, and in, in uh, encouraging uh, private uh, investment and gaining the agreement with the United States and Canada in order to approve the treaty of the commercial treaty and that we continue to have uh, foreign uh, investment. It also helps us very much that they continue to increase the volumes of uh, remittances that are being sent by our people that is growing very much what they send to their family. $35 million a year approximately. And we predict that next year it will grow the remittances like never before in history. It is growing like never before. The investment from foreign companies and the uh, external commerce 
all these things mean growth, economic growth. And in this way, we won't depend solely on petroleum, but not on all the other things, but also on all the other things. What about the relation? The relation is good because we gained the increase in uh, a minimum salary. This had an impact to, uh, to increase sal uh, salaries in general this year. What I was commenting was that this year, the people that are in social security are now working, are making 11,500 a month. That's a median salary. And also there is, that used to be the highest that it used to be. And now I expect that this will continue to get better. It will continue to become strengthened, this salary, but also to make it do it in a gradual way, little by little, but always recovering what the salary lost in the whole neoliberal period. Never again will there be a increase in salary that is below inflation, like it happened before in several years of the last 36 years of the neoliberal period. So, of course, we can't from night to day recover all the loss, but it's a process that's gradual because we need to maintain the companies and the, and the fountains of work. But yes, it will continue to become better. It's very good. Miguel. Excuse me, uh, Mr. President, but in 1980, uh, Serrano's, uh, the petroleum in, was the fourth highest producer. It was very famous in that time, and it was recognized, and Mexico was a secure provider of petroleum. In 80, in France, and, and Swiss and Canada, they used to call us one of the oilers or petroleum people in uh, the world. So, so there was a cabinet. So a year after the 6th of June of 81, Jorge Serrano came out because the petroleum came down and the world was saying, uh, let, you got to lower the prices if I want to buy it. And so the cabinet said no. And he says, if they don't want to buy it from us now, then we won't sell them in. So the market decided, so how can you foresee that all this with the petroleum and the petroleum, it was to the uh, system to, to help feed the country. And they um, so the future prices, it was promissory, and there was an abundance. But all of a sudden, then the petroleum descended, and all that promotion and offers and promises vanished totally. Simultaneously, our technocrats, with all the oil that was present at that time, uh, they stopped producing these technical people, which is a um, requires preparation. And Adela Madrid is, was a prominent Mexican that then Tampico and Tamaulipas. So today, they make plans for uh, science and technology. This eminent uh, Tamayo, the eminent sci scientist, they say to invest more in science and education than in technology. So then how can we foresee or prepare, or how do you prepare 
to put this, uh, how can you critique it or put limitations for well-being for millions of me uh, Mexico and to, pre to foresee or, or mo but what do you think about there could be, what if we had a decline in uh, petroleum? Yes, it is a very good plan, but there are situations that are different. In order to start, at that time, the prices of petroleum were very high. It is not the case now. The prices are at about half of what petroleum costed during the the uh, government of Fox and Caldero. They had the fortune of counting on the prices that were the highest of petroleum in all of history. It was a hundred uh, dollars uh, per barrel as a medium. It was a lot of money that they wasted to say it in a, in a benevolent way. In effect, when Portillo and Villaserrano, they used to talk about preparing ourselves to administrate the abundance, and they bet on it themselves on, on the, so then the prices went down and it generated the social cri crisis that precipitated that that was already starting to happen. So now it's different. We are talking about increasing, little by little, the production and take it to 2 million 600,000 barrels by 2024. We would be at production of uh, what was being uh, being done during the six years of Calderon. So we had a major production in the last few times that 2004 that were obtained 3 million six hundred uh, four hundred thousand barrels. So we're talking about 2,600,000. So we're 800,000 below. So it's not betting everything on that, on production. We would not, besides that, have the resources for that. We would have to indebt the country, and we are not going to do that. And a variable that the technocrats would say that is different is that we don't have corruption in Pemex that they had at that time and that was up until the last government. So the corruption was uh, has affected the country very much. So therefore, they cannot resist this crisis due to the corruption that was uh, in in that was in peril, uh, impairing at that time. So now it's going to be different. And yes, we do have our, us very much caution as to not depend only on petroleum. So now, for example, 
I think with the signature of the treaty, it will grow much more. The foreign investment. There will be more development of the manufacturing industry, very much more development for the internal market and also for exportation. They are giving favorable conditions, not only in the case of petroleum, but even in the case of petroleum, we have uh, when it has to do with external uh, contracts, there's favorable, favorable conditions. And that is why it is very important to us that they approve the treaty because it's convenient for Mexico and it's convenient for the U.S. and it's convenient for Canada. But yes, we are taking that into account and the model that is best, the most rational and cautious and responsible when it comes to exploration in petroleum is Noruegas. They, for example, have to leave out of their uh, income from uh, petroleum, resources for a fund that will then belong to the new generations. That is to say, we now, we're going to utilize the petroleum for the productive energy, but we're going to be um, uh, the idea is um, to think in the new generation's uh, benefit. And we're going to utilize resources for alternative energy sources. We also have to advance in that. In the technological uh, uh, territory, which I respect very much, the opinions of the scientists and the crit 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 critics regarding our politics, but what we're doing now, for example, is reactivate the Institute of Mexican Petroleum, that the technicians are in charge of the rehabilitation. The technology that we are utilizing is of the Institute, uh, Mexican Institute of Petroleum. So yes, there is more uh, technological development now than there was last year. Yes, we can prove it. And this means, of course, more investments in science and technology. And we will not stop supporting this. Uh, it's very important. So yesterday we had pending in order to comply. Ramon Flores. Ramon Flores. Very good day, Mr. President, uh, Secretary Ramon Flores from Los Angeles. President Notimex is giving voice to Miranda, is, uh, recognizes that she, uh, her, okay. Con estas irregularidades, no considera usted esto como un reto para su gobierno. That she admitted that, that uh, she had tortured people. She recognizes to the uh, news. She is. How does your government interpret this for your government? Isn't it a matter of impunity, this act? But if you, it's as you say, yes, it could be an act of tolerance 
or impunity or to tolerate impunity. But we would have to see if there exists a claim that is within the hands of the district attorney. We'll dig into that, into this matter. And, and we will inform you. We'll inform you here. And we'll inform the whole world. The situation that is legal. Mr. President, on the 29th of April of this year, when they presented the uh, biological father, Isabel Miranda told uh, that you protected the, she said that you protected the kidnappers. So why, why now do they confide in you? I don't get involved in these things. Uh, why are they now um, protecting you? Yes, all, all people are free to manifest and express themselves. Let's see what happens with the matter of uh, the legal matters. Because we don't want to go into confrontations. So there's a girl named Sayla that's next. Hello, Mr. President. She's from Sonora and, and, and Tijuana. In Sonora, there's a lot of preoccupation due to violence. Two weeks ago, it's been in a place in a, a armed group. Uh, put a fire, uh, a family was in it, and a, a seven-year-old child was burned alive. And the mother and the daughter of two years were had severe burns, 90% of their body, and the mother died yesterday. And the baby is in Sacramento being attended. And Palme forms part of these five municipalities where the strategic uh, security has been uh, sent a um, uh, military police. We want to ask you what information regarding the advancement of, in the material of security in uh, Sonora. And they said that they had detected those bands or uh, gangs that are operating there. And what are we doing so they can break up these uh, gangs and these crimes? And overall, Mr. President, what can be done by the state to combat this level of violence and dehumanization that is being lived in in the north in uh, Sonora that have these uh, uh, armed groups that will burn people and children. The people, they also did not do the, the yell and bell in that place because they're very affected by this act. We're going to ask the Secretary of Public Safety to come and inform us regarding their situation and insecurity there. How we're doing? and what is being done, as you mentioned, so that we can stop this uh, wave of violence in Sonora. We will help ask him to give us this information. I, in general, every day, we are attending this problem. I spoke to someone that it is a priority, security. We are dedicating complete time to that. and. I continue secure and, and optimistic that we will be able to gain peace in our country, that we will advance, that we are doing everything that is we are able to do on our part, and that your reasons are valid because I have secure, uh, optimism and security. 
because uh, where I found my optimism. First of all, because we work every day on this, and second, because we are working in a coordinated manner. The uh, Army, Marines, police, federal police, state police, in, in agreement with the states, and I'm giving attention daily to the problem. And I am not delegating this matter of security to anyone. I am attending to it personally. And that is why we meet every day in the cabinet security. And I head it. And the Secretary of Defense and Marine are there every day. We do not permit corruption. And, uh, and we are fortifying the National Guard. We are contracting and uh, recruiting more elements for the National Guard, and we're training. And at the same time, it's the base that sustains this whole duty and the social programs and we're trying to uh, advance the country and I believe we are going to gain to detain this violence. So what message do you send to these people because they are very impacted especially the children we send our affection, our, our endearment and solidarity and the commitment to protect them and to be with them always and that the vigilance and the uh, police should become more vigilant and to guarantee public security. And then in Tijuana, there uh, now it's 209 homicides in uh, Tijuana. We will ask the secretary. Um, we'll, um, we'll have an, uh, uh, a bit of information here regarding insecurity. And we'll talk about it on a national level, if you would like. That we need to do like the Cabinet of Security National and inform how we're doing so we can inform the people of how we're doing with this matter. So Jaime Hernandez is next. These were the ones that were pending yesterday. So then we're not going to be making a list anymore because it it's getting very committed and then the whole uh, the, the press conference. So uh, Jaime Hernandez from Baja Palabra. In the last administration, every time they rehabilitated and they made a new road and new, they increased the cost for the people. As of the first of um, so they increased. They increased the cost in September. They increased the tariffs in Cuernavaca, in Acapulco, so they increased it 3%. So the increase in the tariffs of the tariffs um, for the roads, um, they have like toll booths. They qualified the uh, tolls as a government um, they felt like it was being an attack on the tourists because they want to decrease the costs of the roads to increase uh, in order to stop this costs in the tourist areas and to consider the cost, uh, decrease the cost that's always in reparation and by the beach. Yes, uh, look, 
I found out about that increase of the price of the toll booths, of the roads, of quotas, and the increase in the tariffs about a week ago. And it came to happen about three weeks ago, as they tell me. I found out because I passed through one of these areas and they told me this. And they complained to me that they increased it two pesos in the uh, toll booth. But I'm not going to say because I don't want there to be reprisals with the people that charge. But it had increased two pesos. And I said, let me look into this and let me investigate it. Because it surprised me that they increased it. And then I asked for information. And the information that I have is that it increased this tariff related to inflation. That is to say, that's what they did. They increased the cat, uh, the uh, toll due to inflation. But if the increase is more than inflation, they have to correct it. Why? Because if it's an increase according to inflation, then we increase. If we don't, it would be to lower it, the tariff. And I did not commit to lowering the, the tolls, but I just agreed that it would not be in real terms an increase. And regarding the autopista, uh, of Acapu the, the highway of Acapulco, I know the whole story, how much it cost to construct it, how much it cost to rescue it, I have it written down. I think it's the road that is the most expensive in the whole world. No. No. No, that's right. The Mazatlan from Durango actually exceeded it after that. The cost of the roads in the neoliberal period is a great uh, matter for discussion and investigation regarding public works and corruption in Mexico. That road from Acapulco was rescued by the government of Cedillo. They asked for $400 million to rescue it. And, gen and actually, they got $700 million. So then the company got, and then it became a, a bottomless pit. And so now we have to administer it with, admin, with honesty. And not increase the, the tolls on top of inflation. So the, technic, uh, the technicians, uh, they speak of to index. That's the term they use, to index. In this case, it's that the prices maintained according to inflation. That's what we're going to apply in the case of the um, money for tariffs, that if there is a road that has a concession where the tariff is more than inflation, then they have to correct it.
This has to do with kapufa. The other things has to do with concessions, but they cannot abuse, even if it is a concession. If Kapufe maintains this politics, then the most um, correct thing or indicated thing is that all the concessions would act the same way. So, very well. We have Carly. From Radio Pública, United States. No, she did not come. The two ladies in the back. We're going to the back now. I want to ask you, they said the ex-governor the governor of Coahuila is not, is putting, he sent a, he wants someone to be extradited for money laundering, electronic irregularities, procedures that are taken outside the country related to ex-governors. But the investigations that are done here in Mexico, like in the case of Gawila, and, and you even presented uh, proof in 2017 that uh, regarding these matters of these governors. But if he's offering and he's disposed to the authority needs to act. That's my point of view. In the case of the other cases, they can inform you of what it has to do with. We are asking that there be that they do the uh, extradition uh, uh, properties well. The uh, Secretary of External uh, Relations was commenting that in the case of uh, requesting extradition that the governor from Chihuahua, ex-governor from Chihuahua, was not well founded. That is to say that when they presented this the um, application, it appeared that it was not done adequately. Well, in conformity with the established law, and that was what was occasioning or causing that it not be proceeding. So we don't know, but that's what I've been informed, and I don't know exactly. But tomorrow, we will inform, we'll ask Marcelo Abrad to inform us regarding this matter. Regarding the, the governor of, of Cahuilla, Morela, yes, I denounced, I, I turned him in at that time because there was a lot of politics in those cases. But due to electoral questions or due to political differences, and we need to uh, separate ourselves from that because of professionalism and objectivity and sticking strictly to the truth. At that time, we used to talk a lot that he had committed licit acts, the governor of Cahuila, Humberto Moreira, and they accused him from one party. 
a party had a campaign against him. But of course, with the uh, newspapers, everyone, but all of a sudden, we found out that before it fin the, the government ended of that party that was asking that they chastise Moreira, the, the procurement department emitted a written to exonerate of all the crimes to, for the ex-governor Noriega. So, so it was all a, a farce. On one side, publicly, they would say one thing that Maraida is corrupt and he needs to go to jail. But on the other hand, uh, on the side, and they laundered and arrangements that they made because they were specialists in arranging things. They came to an agreement. They exonerated him. So this ex-governor Moreira. And they made the exoneration when he was already president-elect. When Enrique Peña Nieto was already coming out as as Calderón was coming out and Peña Nieto was coming in, they exonerated him in that period. So, so that should not continue to happen. Now there is an association which is called Mexicans Against Corruption. No, that's not what it's called. It's Mexicans in favor of corruption. Oh, no. That. No? Oh, it's not that? No. They direct Claudio X. Gonzalez and others, adversaries of ours. They've dedicated themselves to, to sabotaging us legally. They're the ones that promote the uh, the uh, stops on the uh, works. They don't want us to do anything. They're bothered. They want us to continue the same regimen of corruption. Imagine defending the project of the airport in the middle of the Lake Texcoco that was was the biggest uh, looting that was that had been prepared a greatest abuse that would be done to the people in the nation it would mean about a billion pesos. It would be like a phoba proa. And they're defending that? That's why I got confused and I called the Mexicans in favor of corruption because they remind me a lot of the pact that they've signed a pact for Mexico when it was a fact, in fact, a pact against Mexico. Well, we're done. There's one more person. Uh, do you have, if there's going to be a sale 
eh, sí tuvo que ver la visita de Pablo Roca, eh, Roca eh, y que bueno, la reunión que tuvo con usted hace unas semanas, si sí tiene que ver con la eh, compra, probable compra de altos hornos de México. No, ¿Tiene no, no, if it has to do with the purchases in Mexico, no, that's just a, a fly by night thing. They fly a lot. It has nothing to do with anything. Whatever she was asking about, I'm sorry, I couldn't make out what she was asking. So we'll talk about that on that day. So Mr. President, the uh, lady is asking for her turn, because he had named her. Uh, Mr. President, um, he had said it was her turn. Yes, we'll continue to inform regarding. Uh, uh, we met with the district attorney and his family, and Alejandro Encina will inf uh, present an information, a bit of information, and we'll inform you regarding that. Mr. President. She's the last one. What information have you reported regarding this order of apprehension in the uh, Jorge Winkler? And what call would you make to the coordinator that is already installed outside of the Senate of the Republic and the discussion of the secondary laws of the education reform? And what report have they given you regarding the federal police that are still not happy because they don't want to be part of the National Guard? And we already saw a few days that they did it some manifestations, and yesterday they were uh, refusing to form part of this group. Um, what about the one that, the one that, re he says, I don't have data about the guy that's uh, acting as a procurement in Veracruz. It's being attended to by the uh, district attorney. Uh, it's not a matter that has to do with with executive power. And re regarding the, the police, we're coming to an agreement with them in order that they can pass voluntarily to the National Guard. And the ones that don't want to, they don't want to go to the National Guard they can have other options to belong to to a body that will be in charge of vigilance, the government uh, installations. And we are not uh, firing anybody, and we're not uh, making everybody lose their jobs. But you spoke of another thing. What about the coordinator that's outside, outside the Republic? That's her right to manifest. Yes, that bothers a lot, the conservatives. But it was a farce, a lie, regarding the uh, so-called uh, reform, and it costs a lot. It even costs money out of the budget for their propaganda, for their propaganda against teachers, and there was no results. What there was was suffering. They be, even people lost their lives due to this confrontation and with discord and lack of prestige for the teachers, and all this because they wanted to, because these people, like Gonzalez, very conservative. I don't want to use another word, but it would be more strong, but perhaps 
it would be more clear. <laughs> So I'm self-limiting myself to saying, but yes, they, they were very angered by that with something that, that did not benefit anyone in education. On the contrary, all due to the, their greed to privatize, they need to stop and they need to start to become accustomed that we are not going to apply the same politics as the, as the neoliberals. We are going in a time in the face of the post-neoliberal period, and that is behind us. This anti-political uh, politics of corruption, injustices and privileges. It's a shame, it's an embarrassment for all of us. The fame of Mexico used to be a violence and corruption. And that's what we need to attend to, that that image needs to change. Because how are we going to go on with the same thing? We need to change. Now, we have to change now. It is not permitted to steal. They cannot do those type of uh, businesses that are taking advantage of the public. They were they were used to not paying taxes and controlling and still they used to uh, pose themselves as judges so let's suppose that they would call this organi uh, organization uh, Mexicans Against Corruption what did you do? I would ask them, if corruption was legalized in the uh, time that you worked, corruption was so rampant, why didn't you say anything that Salinas in 1994 changed the penal code so that corruption would no longer be a grave crime? Did you not know this? How is it possible that you created an association, a civil organization that was called Mexicans Against Corruption? Without ever saying anything, never. I would like that they would, they, they would tell me something against that that corruption was legalized because it was not a great crime. I wish they would use, use replica. That's enough of simulations. No, you cannot behave this way. And that's a distinction between conservatism. They are very corrupt. But on top of that, above corruptness, they're also hypocrites. Yeah. And that's enough. We'll see each other. Okay, goodbye. Okay, so that was the, um, the end of uh, today's conference. And um, it was actually very uh, important uh, today because it showed how uh, the petroleum industry uh, is doing very well in Mexico and uh, they're trying to become uh, self-sufficient and um, they showed all the details as to what each uh, plant is doing and they found uh, several new uh, locations where they're going to be uh, digging for uh, oil uh, well, they're already uh, started on some new um,
places that they're going to be drilling. They found 20 new sites that they're starting. And uh, by the end of the year, they expect to be at 1,700,000 or 800,000 barrels, which is about a, a little bit over 50% increase considering that there was a steady decline, uh, that's quite an improvement. And so by next year, they expect to um, start seeing the results. Uh, so they, they want to become self-sufficient and they want to use some of the monies that they make from the petro industry uh, into um, helping uh, reactivate the economy and uh, making themselves self-sufficient with food uh, so if anything happens, they will be able to uh, provide for themselves. And also, he's saying that he wants people to be happy and to uh, be more, um, uh, to, to be able to uh, stay in Mexico, you know, to be able to support themselves in Mexico. And the last part of this talked a little bit about corruption, and he mentioned these uh, this group, which is known um uh, they call themselves uh, Mexicans Against Corruption, but he says they're actually Mexicans for corruption because they're the ones that are have been putting all the um, uh, stops um, to the building of the new airport, which is not in the middle of the lake. They uh, It looks like they were for the building of the airport that was in the middle of the lake, which had um, a lot of people that were uh, wealthy uh, and had uh, wealthy investors that had already invested um, in uh, the uh, lake and people who had already made plans for making these juicy deals uh, in Mexico in this uh, airport, which was uh, definitely going to be sinking and they were going to have to be putting uh, like a new levy on the people, he says, like the Foba Proa, which is kind of like a um, uh, additional tax that has been added to the people from when they uh, bailed out the banks. And what they did was they bailed out the banks, the banks started making money, they never paid back any of the debt, nor do they intend to, and the debt was added to the people. And so they've got a... a uh, never-ending debt and so he says this uh, uh, place that they were uh, uh, Toxcoco or uh, Texcoco uh, was the lake that they had planned on uh, they had drained and uh, planned on building building the airport at is sinking every year about a meter minimum and the ground is boggy because it's the uh, like it is in the middle of a bunch of uh it's the valley of a bunch of mountains and so the water uh, constantly fills there plus uh safety wise it's not very safe because it is the site because of the water there was many many uh types of uh birds that naturally flock there every year and uh when the birds flock there they um, there's a lot of risks and there have been lots of uh, airplane accidents where the birds get into the engines. So it is definitely unsafe, uh, expensive, and people had poised themselves to collect, uh, well, to be the ones uh, supposedly uh, refilling or lifting or it was, it was going to cost a lot of money to try and keep that uh, airport afloat as it was sinking and also to keep it water free because the water wants to drain there when the in the rainy season after the ice melts on the hills so it was uh, definitely a losing uh, strategy to build it there but it was definitely going to make money for a lot of people that were interested in stealing from the country so there's still uh, these uh, Mexicans uh, against corruption were actually part of the corruption and they're the ones uh, that were imposing a lot of these stays uh, for the project. Uh, so they're still going forth with a project that uh, is at Santa Lucia, 
which is where the old airport was. They're refurbishing it, and they're also adding the military Air Force Base, which also, these are very good sites and safe sites for the airports. So they're building uh, those areas instead, but um, they're dealing with all the, uh, uh, how shall I say, holds that were being brought upon by, by these uh, corrupt um, people that were trying to, to keep the works from uh, going to their maturity. Okay, anyway, so that's the end. I just wanted to do a little synopsis for you at the end because sometimes people don't have time for the whole thing. So I think I'll start doing that now. Is I'll just do a synopsis at the end if you just want to go to the very end and, and listen for the synopsis. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. Bye.